Over the Garden Wall. Only released a little under a decade ago in 2014, it is already a cult classic and a favorite fall rewatch. Welcome or welcome back. If you're new here, I like to use folklore and literature from around the world to inspire D&D, especially the Feywild. Over the Garden Wall may not be literature, and it may not be folklore itself, but it does draw a lot from folklore around the world and in different time periods, especially folklore surrounding death. And while being heavy on the theme of death, it is also very cozy and nostalgic. If you've seen it, you know exactly what I mean. If you haven't and you don't want spoilers, this is not the video for you. I will be spoiling whatever I want, whenever I want, because I want to use this show to inspire even a whole campaign, probably more of a mini campaign, but here's what I'm going to do. First, I'm going to talk about the unknown, the location where the majority of the show takes place and what that could be in D&D &D world. I'm going to lay the groundwork for our BBEG, The Beast. I'm then going to talk about different ideas for getting a party involved in this storyline, different campaign intro ideas. The majority of this video will be me talking about different locations and NPCs inspired by different episodes. And at the end of the video, I'll have a few helpful hints and tips if you want to really capture the atmosphere of the show when using it for your D&D sessions. I feel like this goes without saying, but you don't have to take my ideas and use every single one of them. You don't have to make this a whole campaign. You can just take little pieces. And as always, if this video inspires you or you have any ideas that you think you could add to the table, please comment below. I only have the brain of one person. I want to know what you think. Okay, I want to get into Over the Garden Wall as a D&D &D campaign. A quick summary of the show. Wirt and Greg are two brothers trying to get home, but they are lost in the unknown. It's sort of like a limbo-like space is what a lot of people interpret it to be. But in the unknown, there are several antagonists, namely the Beast, who are trying to prevent them from ever leaving. So the unknown itself, like I said, a lot of people consider it to be a limbo space where the boys are stuck. You find out later in the show that they are potentially drowning in a river and are later rescued, but all the events of the show, while presented, hinted at to have actually happened, are not on the normal world. The Unknown has a number of features that makes me think it would work really well translated into the Feywild. It has a lot of talking animals, it has some strange whimsical elements, it also has Edelwood trees that were once the souls of lost children. I mean, come on. The Feywild in both folklore and D&D is notorious as a place where children get lost. On the other hand, if you wanted the unknown to be more of a pocket space, that's not the word I'm looking for, but its own separate space, I think it would work really well as a domain of dread. A domain of dread can be any size. It's a very dark place ruled by a dark lord. So the BBEG or the beast could be ruling over this land. And it would make more sense that you could kind of do whatever you wanted in there because it would have its own rules, its own structure. It would play up the sense of dread that permeates over the garden wall. Wirt and Greg, more than anything, cannot lose hope because that's how the beast gets them. And in a domain of dread, maintaining that kind of hope would be really hard. Let's talk about the beast. The beast is a very creepy bad guy, to put it simply. The beast is normally cloaked and lingering in dark spaces. It looks like he has these long antlers coming out of his head. We get a brief shot of him in the light during which we see that he's actually made of Edelwood branches in these faces that I can only assume are the souls of the lost. He's also full of holes. It's very creepy. The beast is also well-spoken. He's manipulative. He's cunning. One example of that in action is that he needs a lantern to stay alive. The souls of these lost children turn into Edelwood trees and that specific wood is used to make oil to keep his lantern alive. That's the motivation behind all of this. In the past, a character called the Woodsman got the lantern from the beast who convinced the Woodsman that his daughter's soul was trapped inside, therefore requiring the Woodsman to start harvesting the Edelwood branches and turning it into oil. The beast may have lost a battle. He may have lost his lantern, which is quite important to have seeing as it's essentially his life in that lantern. But despite that, he convinces someone else 
to keep it burning for him. For D&D, we don't have the beast as written in Over the Garden Wall. He's a very specific enemy and you could create a homebrewed version of him for a game, but I think there's also two other D&D monsters that are already in existence that could work well as a replacement. First, I think the beast could be a night hag. This would be for a slightly lower level party and it would probably work better in the Feywild seeing as hags are traditionally more fey. And again, the Feywild is a place where children traditionally go missing. So she could be specifically targeting them in this region that she creates. She could use her nightmare haunting to weaken or cause despair within the children. And in D&D, when a person is weakened enough by this nightmare haunting, they eventually become trapped in a night hag's soul bag. After about 24 hours, their soul is normally sent to Hades, but I have other ideas. Maybe a soul bag in this context could contain multiple souls that aren't sent to Hades. Or rather than sending them away, maybe the night hag needs these children's souls to survive and she's consuming them to fuel herself. I believe the beast is also able to change his shape, which is an ability night hags also have. So I think, I think something like that could work. On the other hand, if you wanted to do a domain of dread, why couldn't you have a lich or it's not a leech, right? A lich as your BBEG. A lich could be functioning as a dark lord. It's not going to be difficult to come up with a reason that a lich is being punished and kept in this domain of dread. I also specifically like the lich as a beast because of soul sacrifices, which is when a lich must periodically feed souls to its phylactery to sustain the magic preserving its body and consciousness. Sort of what I was presenting for the night hag, but actually written into D&D. It could be preying on the souls of children to keep it alive. And maybe there can be an additional rule where both a night hag or a lich have to only prey on the souls of children that have lost hope. And so a lich could use something like its frightening gaze to try and wear down even the most hardy children. It could just be a strange twist of magic specifically for this domain. Let's talk party involvement. How does your party get involved in all of this? One option is that they just stumble into this area. If they're in the Feywild, they could be walking around a wild space or into a certain region and just happen upon this general location where a bunch of interesting stuff is happening or they could be traveling through domains of dreads and happen to stumble into this one. If you want a more intentional approach, maybe there's two boys, Wirt and Greg, although, you know, maybe rename them, depends on how on the nose you want to be, who have gone missing. And the party is able to track them into this domain of dread. They're transported there. What I like about that is the party could be essentially following the boys through the different locations. They visit one, they encounter whatever there is to encounter there, and they're told that the boy's headed to this next place, and they're trying to catch up to them in order to save them. Or if you wanna do something a little different, maybe the party is children. They're a group of friends who are maybe like level zero adventurers. You know, you'd have to scale things down quite a bit. Level zero, level one, maybe they're raised by adventurers, I don't know. But they're friends who stumble in this domain of dread and the beast is actively seeking them and their souls. We've laid the groundwork for the unknown, where it could be, the beast, different monster options, if you want to use something already constructed for D&D, and then how your party can specifically find themselves in this realm, different intros for how they get involved, but what's there? For this next part, I'm going to talk about eight key locations in the unknown and maybe some NPCs or combat encounters you could sprinkle in there. The first space is the old grist mill. This is where the woodsman lives and where he turns Adelwood branches into oil for the lantern. While there, the boys are attacked by a giant dog with scary glowing eyes. They're able to defeat it by getting it to cough up this strange oily, black turtle. The turtles are never really explained, but the Over the Garden Wall wiki suggests that maybe they are covered in Edelwood oil and they represent some inner darkness that when consumed can corrupt the mind and the body, which means that when the dog spits up the turtle, it just turns into a normal dog. This place to me feels like a classic first stop for a group of adventurers. They meet an NPC who might be important, who might 
just introduce them to the realm. And they can also have a brief combat encounter to give him a little taste of what's in the area. My idea for the woodsman is to sort of combine him with another character that I haven't talked about yet, Beatrice, who is trying to trick Wirt and Greg into going to Adelaide's house. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but she tells them that Adelaide can send them home when in the reality, Adelaide plans to enslave the boys. With my BBEG ideas, I don't know that having a lantern with a soul trapped inside would be the best move. I think it could be good flavor for him to have a lantern, but maybe the woodsman has lost his daughter to the beast, just like he has in the show. The woodsman has lost his daughter to the beast who has promised him it's a lie, but has promised him that if he can send enough children and their souls along the way towards the beast, that eventually, in exchange, he can receive back the soul of his daughter and save her. The woodsman can still be helpful and kind and accommodating to the party and maybe sincerely want to help them while at the same time trying to keep secret that he is complicit in sending along children to be entrapped. My idea for this first combat encounter is sort of like it happens in the show and it's on a lower level, so, you know, adjust as needed. But I think that they should be attacked there by a dire wolf, maybe a pack of dire wolves, or maybe a yeth hound if you're in the Feywild. It's a little beefier than a dire wolf and it has baleful baying, which can cause fear in the characters. That could also work because yeth hounds are specifically created by powerful dark figures, so the BBEG could be bringing them into this realm. And a big bad wolf is also just so fairy tale. It's nostalgic, just like the show is. The next location is Pottsfield, which is a town surrounded by farmland. It's a place where giant turkeys pull carts instead of horses. And the townspeople look like they have pumpkin heads and straw bodies. And that's what we're and Greg believe when they meet them. But when the boys arrive, they do interrupt a harvest festival, disrespected a little by accident. And so the ruler, Enoch, sentences them to a day's hard labor. Enoch, by the way, is a black cat controlling a giant pumpkin. We're and Greg, during their labor, dig two large holes, dig up skeletons, get freaked out, but the skeletons come to life. And then it turns out that all of the people are skeletons. These new ones pop on some pumpkin heads, put on some straw costumes. And it turns out that this is a place where the dead are sort of being brought back to life to just live again. According to the wiki, a potter's field, also known as a common grave, is a term for a place for the burial of unknown or impoverished people who could not afford marked graves. In the D&D version of Pottsfield, it wouldn't make sense for these to be the souls of lost children since presumably they are being consumed or sent somewhere, but they could be the souls of citizens or other unhappy passerbys who happen to die in this area. The Feywild is supposed to be really connected to the material plane though, so maybe these souls are coming from a parallel place on the material plane. That could work. These people could be beholden to the BBEG. I like the idea that they're not, but you could go either way. If they're not, then the party could have a place to stay here in Pottsfield. It's a little creepy, a little unsettling. There are some rules, namely don't trample the pumpkins, but it could be a nice little spot to stop and stay for the night. If you look in the monster manual, you can also check out scarecrows and those monsters, they could be guarding the fields for a little extra flavor if the party like tries to sneak into town that way. And I am honestly not sure what to make of Enoch. If you have any ideas for how to translate a black cat controlling a giant floating pumpkin in this community of skeletons, let me know. Next is the animal schoolhouse, which is where the teacher, Miss Langtree, tries to teach a number of woodland creatures how to read and write and play instruments. In this episode of the show, Wirt and Greg learn that Miss Langtree's father runs the school and he's trying to shut it down or threatening to because it's just not making any money. Miss Langtree also has a love, Jimmy Brown, who has left her. There's also a wild gorilla on the loose. Admittedly, a school for woodland animals is very fey. This is one of those places that translates super easily to the Feywild, especially when we have creatures like herringons and bullywugs. You could just have a community of small animals getting their education here. Maybe a bard in your party could volunteer to teach a lesson and in return receive some valuable information or maybe some trinkets. I also like the idea of a combat encounter here. Maybe the school really is being attacked on the regular by a big, Gorilla. I think that could be really fun and chaotic, especially in the Feywild. 
But if you wanted something more classic fantasy, you wanted to lean in that nostalgia direction, you could also do something like an ogre or other big scary individual that, you know, children are able to hide from, but is continuing to terrify this schoolhouse. And I'll get into this idea a little more later, but maybe these animals in this gorilla, if that's what you go for, used to be human and was transformed. Next, we have the tavern. The tavern is a place where characters with very specific identities can be found. You have the innkeeper, the baker, the tailor, his apprentice, the highwayman. In the show, the people at the tavern are concerned with discovering Wirt's identity. At first, they decide he's the lover, and then they realize he's the pilgrim. And that's what they, they, they don't like that he doesn't feel like he can be defined. They need him to have an identity. This is also the episode where they steal a talking horse named Fred, who probably belonged to the highwayman. A tavern is classic D&D. &D. Why not have one here? And I also like the idea that the tavern's people aren't used to outsiders, so maybe they do really want to find their identities. They don't go by their names, they go by their role, their job. And so even if the party just says, oh, we're the adventurers, just acknowledging an identity gives them immediate rapport with the people here. Here they could rest, load up on some comfort, cozy food, some ale, learn more about the beast, maybe get pickpocketed by the highwayman, steal his horse. In another episode, Wirt and Greg come across a mansion. They are stopping here in hopes of getting some coins so that they can take the ferry to get to Adelaide's house. They pretend to, the, the man who lives there, they pretend to be his nephews. He seems a little crazy and buys into it, but this mansion is so big and elaborate that it's turned into a sort of labyrinth, and the man thinks that he's seen a ghost there, when in reality, the mansion's just so big that it accidentally connected to another mansion, and he's seeing the owner of that mansion, who is also his rival in the tea industry. They do fall in love, of course. How could they not? One idea I had for this place in D&D is a sort of ghostly trap. Of course, you could have a giant mansion and a place that the party could stay, but I like the thought that the man living inside has been trapped there. He can't leave because a ghost residing there won't let him. Once the party enters the mansion, they are now trapped too. They have to figure out a way to either appease or destroy this ghost in order to get out. This would basically be a dungeon for them. They'd be wandering these vast, beautiful halls looking for clues, and plot twist, which maybe isn't that much of a twist, but plot twist, the old man has actually killed someone and it's their ghost that's haunting him. And the party can find the body buried somewhere in an inside garden under some tea leaves. And if the party escapes, surely they can find enough wealth or trinkets to be able to jump on our next location, the ferry. In the show, the ferry or riverboat is how the characters travel to Adelaide's house. It's how they cross some land. The party could have an option to ride it as well. The ferry is piloted and ridden by anthropomorphic frogs. Those are the only other types of creatures Wirt and Greg meet there. And here's where translating something to D&D is just too easy. Bullywugs. Bullywugs in D&D have fun personalities. You should read up on them. I think it would be great for the party to need to take the ferry to get to their next location and just be on this ride with a group of bullywugs. If you're in the Feywild, maybe instead of a coin, it costs a trinket to ride. In the show, where and Greg have to hide from getting kicked off since they don't end up having the coins to ride. They have to hide by pretending to be band members and there's some really beautiful music in the episode. It's sort of jazzy, but then whimsical and nostalgic. So maybe there's beautiful music on this boat as well. The next location is Adelaide's house. Now going back to Beatrice, Beatrice is a bluebird and she was turned into one by throwing a rock at a bluebird and her whole family was actually turned into bluebirds. And so Adelaide has told her that if she can bring her two young boys or two young children to become her slaves, well, she doesn't present it that way. She doesn't say they're going to be slaves, but to bring her two young children that in return, she will turn Beatrice and her family back into human beings. I feel like I said that in a really convoluted way. Beatrice is tricking the boys into going to Adelaide's house. She calls her the good woman of the woods, but she changes her mind at the last minute 
and it's last minute enough that she can't warn Wirt and Greg what she's doing, and so they go there anyway. They find Adelaide, they get trapped by this net made of yarn, and they have to escape by opening a window and letting in cold air, which is deadly to Adelaide and kills her. I think Adelaide could really easily be some sort of minor or less powerful hag, even if you have a hag as your BBG, maybe this one is learning from her or is just beholden to her and, you know, does her own thing in this area. Maybe Adelaide, this minor hag in her little hut off in the woods, is actually the one that keeps turning people into animals. Maybe she's turned children into animals and that's where we get the schoolhouse. In the show, she has a pair of scissors that can snip Beatrice away from her animal form. Maybe there's a similar magical item. I mean, in Wild Beyond the Witchlight, so like, small spoiler for that, but in Wild Beyond the Witchlight, one of the hags has a pair of scissors that she can use to snip a shadow off a person and she then has control over that shadow. So why not have a pair of scissors that can be used to snip away a soul from an animal's body so it can return to a human form. This could be an ongoing subplot where the party is trying to figure out how to help free these people from their animal bodies. Our last location is the Lonely Cottage, where two characters, Lorna and Auntie Whispers, live. In the show, the boys meet Lorna. She's a pretty young girl, she's about Wirt's age, and she is beholden to Auntie Whispers, who looks all scary. Auntie Whispers controls Lorna with a bell that compels her to do certain things, and the boys want to help her escape. But it turns out that the bell was actually controlling an evil spirit that is possessing Lorna, and when they almost escape with her, they also almost get eaten by her. In the end, they use the bell to compel this spirit to leave Lorna's body and never come back. The show is actually misleading, and Auntie Whispers is a good character, despite looking and sounding a little scary. She's also Adelaide's sister and warns the boys of her, although it's a little too late, seeing as they've already had to escape her. However you'd want to use this cottage and these characters and maybe this ghostly possession circumstance, I like the idea of there being a bell that can command spirits. A magic item like this could be very broken very easily. So I think maybe, you know, whether you have to require attunement or can only work on one ghost at a time, they have to make a saving throw. It could work similar to some sort of charm spell. But I, I think that could be cool. And for the final portion of this video, we have a few other advice and tips that I think would just help really pull all of this together. I asked my Discord channel if they had any ideas and one person reminded me that music is such a key part of this show. It's nostalgic, atmospheric, it's classic. Sometimes there's jazz music, sometimes there's folk music, but it does so much to just lend to the atmosphere of the show. For background music, I think you should have some sort of collection or playlist of songs that are somewhere in that vein. I think there's actually some that have already been created on YouTube. Other ideas for achieving that nostalgia and the cozy fall nature of the show is to have some good Halloween decorations. Maybe have a bunch of small pumpkins in the middle of the table or decorating the room. You could have props like a lantern, an old bell, maybe even some tickets for the fairy. The party could even design characters based off traditional folklore or maybe some Halloween characters since at the end we learned that all of this started Halloween night. You want to keep it both spooky and cozy. That's really what this show is. All right, this is probably the longest video I've ever filmed, but I just love this show so much. And I think there's just some solid gold that you can use in D&D based off of it. If you liked this video, give it a like. If you want more videos like it, subscribe. And like I said earlier, let me know in the comments what ideas you have, what you think you might use in your own campaign, and if you'll do a full campaign. Are you feeling a fall mini campaign this year? And as always, I hope you have a great whatever it is, and I will see you next time.